welcome to the Red Wheelbarrow. My name is Vicki, and I will be in the background answering any WebEx technical questions. If you experience technical difficulties at any time during this WebEx event, you may contact WebEx Technical Support at 1-866-229-3239, or you may submit your technical issue via the Q&A panel, and I will attempt to assist you. We do encourage everyone to use the audio broadcasting, but if you would like to join the teleconference via the phone, you will need to close down the audio broadcasting box and request the phone by clicking on the phone icon below the participant list. It will then provide you with the dial-in number, along with the event number, and your personal attendee ID number. We will be holding a Q&A session at the conclusion of today's presentation. You may ask an online question at any time throughout the presentation today by simply clicking on the question mark icon located on the toolbar in the bottom or the right side of your screen. Please send questions to all panelists. Today's webinar is being recorded, and a link to the recording will be made available to everyone through their email. With that, we would invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy today's presentation. I would now like to introduce you to your moderator for today, Dr. Don Kelly, head of school. Dr. Kelly, you now have the floor. Thank you, Victoria. Alumni, faculty, parents, and friends, thank you for joining us this afternoon for the fourth in our series of webcasts by Horace Mann School faculty members. We developed these presentations to help celebrate the 125th anniversary of the school. Throughout our 125 year history, our school has educated generations of leaders in a wide range of fields. William Carlos Williams, a graduate, a 1903 graduate of Horace Mann School, is one example of the kind of life that motivates our teaching. His poetry remains current, relevant, and popular today. This afternoon's presentation features three of our most respected upper division English department faculty members, Dr. Adam Kasdan, Ms. Jerry Woods, Mr. Harry Bald. Today they will engage in a roundtable discussion of William's iconic poem, The Red Wheelbarrow, that will illustrate different approaches to understanding, enjoying, and teaching poetry. We hope that this opportunity to step into the classroom will call to mind the kind of vibrant, engaging teaching that you remember experiencing at Horace Mann School or that your child is currently enjoying today. Thank you for joining our virtual classroom. We hope you have questions and comments to share with all of us at the end of the presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. It's a beautiful spring day up here in the Bronx. And we're excited to talk about poetry, as we do every day. And as we do in our classrooms, we dive right in. So I'm not going to say too much about the uh, English department, except um, it occurred to me as I was sitting down at my desk this morning that I had recently had a discussion with a student about the difference between meaning and meaningfulness and the way in which he was trying to make the meanings that he was coming to in his study of literature meaningful to himself. And I think it, at, at heart, what we're doing in the English department is just that. Not all these great works of art are meaningful to us. And so with that, I'm going to turn to the poem, The Red Wheelbarrow. It occurred to us as we were talking about what we might share with uh, alums and uh, parents and, and uh, uh, current students, wh which poem we might share. The Red Wheelbarrow is this enduring work of art. Uh, strangely uh, simple and yet beguilingly complex. And uh, as I as I talked to colleagues around the department, they said, "Yes, yes, let's let's uh, let's talk about it." And in fact, we had very very different readings of it. So I'm going to introduce Jerry Woods and Harry Bald. I'll, I'll moderate the discussion, and we'll we'll dive right into a discussion of the red wheelbarrow. And here's here's the poem. Perhaps uh, Jerry, will you give us a reading? The Red Wheelbarrow by William Carlos Williams. So much depends upon a red wheel barrow glazed with rain water beside the white chickens. And as, as we do in our classrooms, we often ask students to read poems twice. So Harry, will you give us a rendition? The Red Wheelbarrow. So much depends upon a red wheelbarrow glazed with rainwater beside the white chickens. Thank you. So where to begin? Well, one place is, uh, I noticed in Jerry's reading, Jerry wanted to emphasize the line breaks 
and in the poem. And uh, I think it's one of the most striking features among many striking features of the poem is uh, where the lines end. And if you, you could hear, I think, in Jerry's reading, um, the, the, the breaks, she wanted to emphasize those breaks. And I think that was an interesting choice uh, that you made in that reading. And uh, maybe you could talk about why you did that or what you were uh, seeing there or how you thought of that. It's an interesting poem to look at. And I think that it, I very much agree with Hugh Kenner, critic Hugh Kenner's reading that this is essentially a visual form, the poem as a construct on the page. So reading it aloud is problematic in a lot of ways. It does not lend itself to reading aloud. It's not natural. It doesn't sound to me, um, it doesn't sound poetic. And yet when I look at it, it's the essence of poetry that glazed with rainwater. It's not just wet. It's not just moist. It's not sitting outside and, and getting rusty. It's glazed. So there's beauty there. But I think it's something that I look at rather than something I hear. Does it, does it, um, does it strike you as a, as a visual image as beautiful? Because you talk about glazed and beauty, the aesthetic is crucial to our understanding of, of the arts in general. I think when I look at it, the first thing that occurs to me is that wheelbarrow is really supposed to be one word. Mm. I actually went to the Oxford English Dictionary to see when the poem was written, was there any tradition at all of breaking that word up? And the answer is no. It's always been one word. And yet for him it's two. So clearly the way it looks and the way the lines break matter. Um, sure. Like um, what, what's going on in wheelbarrow and rainwater? I mean, we're getting very we're get, going into the details before we even, uh, I think, uh, sketch something larger here. But if you look at wheelbarrow and rainwater, um, the way the break is, it makes it seems to make an adjective out of wheel and rain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or or when you think about it, uh, the thing that sometimes comes up in English classes is. Uh, and when you're studying medieval literature, earlier literature, are these things called kennings that come out of the um, uh, Beowulf and other uh, uh, Middle English and Old English forms. And, and, and he's also doing that so that um, a kenning would be a, a, a figure of speech that instead of calling the ocean the ocean or the sea in a poem, you would call it the whale road. Mm. That's a kenning, you'd say, and then they, they sailed the whale road. And he's sort of doing that <laughs> He's sort of making that uh, kennings out of wheelbarrow and rainwater, even though you read them as well as adjective noun. This, it brings it to me the idea of the necessary connection between wheelbarrow, as you suggest, Jerry, and even rainwater. I'm not sure what else could follow. But for me, and the, it's at the white, almost anything could come next. It's all about the chicken. It's all for me. It's all about the chicken. You know? <laughs> it's like a surprise. It's like a surprise ending. You know, it's it's uh, who who knows what's there and and uh, I don't know what. Uh, well, I, I I agree with that. But you have a you do have a surprise ending, and one of the the reasons that um, or one of the ways he gets more surprise out of it is in the or is by the arrangement of the lines. So so you can see that it goes. Go ahead. Show the pros. So we, we decide we we offer it to you in in prose. And one of the great critiques of the poem uh, by a critic named Jaina Joya is that this is nothing more than um, uh, a line of prose lineated in an interesting fashion. Um, I don't I don't actually happen to agree with him, but and Jerry's point was that actually it is hard to say it because, and yet at the same time, it's hard to say it because, why, what was your thing about it? Why is it hard to say? I think it doesn't flow naturally. It, it's quite odd, like separating wheel and barrow, separating rain and water, um, and even white and chickens. Yeah. So I think that it, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't lend itself to a reading. It, it, it allowed, it, rends, it lends itself to a visual image. And actually that stems from the story that Williams uh, recounted about writing the poem. He was sitting next to the bed of a dying girl as a physician, and that's obviously his other career. And he's looking through the window, and he sees this, and it the wheelbarrow belonged to uh, a fisherman. And 
He simply writes what he sees. So the fact that it's a, a, construct, a visual construct, I think, to me, comes partly from the fact that that's what he sees. Mm. And, and in my mind, his best poetry is he's telling you, or showing you, rather, what he sees and making you look through his eyes. Uh, a lot of his poetry was written on prescription pads when he was coming back from house calls, when they still had house calls. <laughs> and I think that that I see this and you need to look at this is is the urgency of the poem. So, so but what is that? What is that? Uh, I, I, there's a vividness and a directness to the to the image. But what does that make of the first line, well, what, which which yeah. is which is radically non-imagistic? It's conceptual. Correct. It, it, uh, there are a number of critics. A lot of you know, a million critics have had their had their hack at this poem, um, and a lot of it's very interesting, and a lot of it's uh, useless. But um, in, in, in in actually appreciating or apprehending or really receiving what the poem is doing, um, and what the poem is doing rather than saying is the thing that I think Jerry's talking about it as a visual piece. And that's something uh, that I think I want to come back to over and over again. The interesting thing about what you're saying, Adam, and what, when Jerry brings up the, uh, the origin, what the triggering moment was for Williams is that he removes that completely. And he removes any access to it or any clue to it. And this is, this is I think, very helpful for us in learning to read a poem. This poem, any poem, Keats poems, Shakespeare poems, this poem can help teach us what it is that we're supposed to be doing when we read a poem. Because a lot of times, I think in English classes, we're teaching students, they have the, we, we're going we're gonna to decode it and find the hidden messages. Uh, there's a meaning that's hidden. And actually, in a, po in a poem and from a poet that, who is so plain spoken that when he wants to tell you something, he'll tell it to you, as he does in many poems, um, here he deliberately, uh, teasingly maybe, uh, Kenner says c cunningly, r does not let you into what prompted it for him. So what is, so we don't get that. So, that, so in other words, it's, are you saying it's anti-lyric? Well, so I, the, lyric, lyri the lyric being the, the, uh, uh, the lyric eye, the effusion of the inner consciousness or a representation of of a thought, or a or even just a fleeting feeling. Where is the eye? Now, Wallace Stevens removes but the, the, the eye. Re I'm saying the reflection at the beginning. Yes, is the is the eyes where the eye is. The eye, and and it's and it's a, but it's a certain of a certain kind. Well, it's interesting there. Is you're saying I, and you mean E Y E, but I'm hearing I. Yes, yes right. Where no, is I the mean I. I mean I. I. I mean the capital I. Okay, I mean I. but yeah. I'm looking at this, and I'm saying he means where is your eye. Like, what are you seeing, and therefore, what are you relating to? For me, the so much depends. Uh, I've had many conversations with students through the years, and, mm. and part of the conversation is what depends upon. Yes. And then uh, one of the most memorable was with Gil Shaham, and he said, I don't get this. What if so much okay, depends? Right, right. And, and he's a violinist, and I said, you're an artist. You, you make beautiful music. What depends on this? And, and he said everything. If there's no beauty, there's nothing. Mm. And to me, so much depends. I go back to that conversation in my mind fairly often because to look, to see, glazed with rainwater, that's, a, that's beauty. It doesn't matter how humble or how simple that scene. So in a sense, to me, he's defining art. So, what, so, so beauty depends. Or noticing depends. Noticing the, the, and, and in the case of the poem, it's the act of looking at the poem also, not just the image. Um, here's where, when you were talking about it as a visual thing, uh, Williams' uh, connection to the visual arts, his, the way he's working from, around this time, the synthetic cubists in art, uh, or he's, he's very familiar with them, is very interested in what they're doing, um, I think helps, helps him... Uh, and helps us see the poem as something itself. Aside from the wheelbarrow, the rainwater, the chickens, we look at the poem, and the poem itself so much depends upon experiencing the sequence of images as it steps down. It's like his poem about the cat. As the cat steps down, 
um, first the right forepaw, then the left into the empty flower pot. So mm. it's, it's that act of paying attention in the poem, which is separate from the image that's being uh, uh, referred to. And that's more like uh, the contemporary art that he's dealing with, which is no longer a frame or a window through which you see something. And I show here a, a slide from Kurt Schwitter's uh, um, a collage of, of found objects, and it's really the juxtaposition of things here. Um, it's not exactly what Williams would have been looking at. But I, but I also want to say that there's, there's a literal depending in the poem. So the, the root of the word, uh, the Latin, to hang, you know, pendant, um, so, so much depends upon the word that follows, wheel, rain, white. The poem itself is, is, is revealed in, that, in, that, uh, in those moments and with that, with that kind of dependence. I wonder, the, the problem of dependence in poetry, I mean, it's, it's linguistic, wheel, barrow, and when you, when you actually break the natural connection, you're, you're in some way making them independent. Oh, is, there, <laughs> is there a tension there? I don't know. Well, look at and the thing. elements are independent. I mean, rain, rainwater on a wheelbarrow is a, is a kind of interdependence. But it's almost cinematic. If you think for a moment that first you're looking at the wheelbarrow, mm -hmm. and then, then you're getting close up, you Something know, you know yeah. you zoom in and you see the water, and then, then zoom out a little bit, and then you see the chickens. So it's almost cinematic there. Uh, and the changes it's a little mini-documentary, it's a little... Uh, yeah, yeah. There's a, it, this comes from his collection, Spring and All, which is a combination of prose and poetry. That's where this poem first appeared. So right. uh, without a title, it, we, should, we should note, it did not, the title wasn't added until later when he published it in, in, uh, in a different book. And there's a line from his introduction, and he says, there is a constant barrier between the reader and his consciousness of immediate contact with the world. And then later he says, to whom then am I addressed to the imagination? So I wonder if, in fact, he's talking to imagination, to his own imagination, and asking what depends upon and finding his own answer in that. Will you read that line again about the barrier? There is a constant barrier between the reader and his consciousness of immediate contact with the world. So how do you think this... And I'm showing here a slide from the from Spring and All, from where the from where the poem appears, and it's really one of the last poems in the um, in this combination of prose and poetry. Um, and oftentimes the poems have been referred to as um, demonstrations of or metaphors for poetry, for the kind of poetry that that uh, Williams is calling for or or trying to conjure up through his uh, critical. Uh, writing his his sort of manifesto like take on the on the world of poetry as he sees it at that time. Um, so how does this break the barriers? Do you think? I mean, it's interesting. Well, it, further in, it, along in the introduction, he says that the thing he never knows and never dares to know is what he is at the exact moment that he is. So you can know the past, you can know the future, but you cannot know the present. And it seems to me that poetry is reaching to the present moment, yeah. to be there, to see, to, it's almost Zen. Well, and of course, it, it even looks like a Zen, uh, yeah. it, it, it even looks yeah. like an American haiku, uh, yes. in, yes. in that sense, yeah. And, and yet, its presentness is belied by that first line, which bothers me so much. Because there's something not there. Yeah, well, and, there's, and it's, re it's reflective. It's, I mean, this is the... Well, we're going to have to get the barrier up. No, we're going to have to get this, this the first line here a little bit. Uh, well, one wrinkle that's interesting on um, to what you're noting about de pendere, yeah. the, where depends comes from, is that it's followed by uh, a, an, a an opposite movement up up yeah. on. You have hanging down, up on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in that in that second movement, and this in, in that second. Uh, uh, in the second line, and this may be going, <laughs> this may be going <laughs> it, 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 nowhere or nowhere, nowhere happy and nowhere good, right. um, um, because I, I, I do want to maintain that view of the poem that is actually, and Jerry, you were suggesting this, is actually kind of nonverbal. One of the Ezra Pound said to him in 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 the twenties when Pound was kind of his mentor and. In, in Paris, was 
Remember this about your stuff. Uh, it's opaque. That's what gives it its, you know, its opacity. And um, there's something about why this poem endures, what makes it, Tom talked about it, as iconic, how this little thing got to be such a big deal has to do with something that actually is not verbal. It's not susceptible to our doing the, the super, super duper close reading, maybe. No, I think it does resist in some way. It the space of it. And, and yet the, the, the pens <laughs> invites it. And, and then you, you're, the prepositions, I mean, I was going to, you know, you, I could, you could do a number on besides, right? I mean, Absolutely. The, the juxtapositions, really, and, and both uh, in terms of the, the, uh, the language and the visual. I think poetry is often a way to tap into something that is not verbal. So it's the paradox that you have to use words to get beyond words. And, and a concrete image, I guess. And a concrete image. So for the favorite poems of Williams for me, um, when the, the, on the road to the Contagion Hospital and mm -hmm. the Contagious Hospital and the, um, those, he was doctor, so he had to look and he had to observe. And I think the things that he decided to aim that laser-like attention at automatically change them because you're looking at them. No, it's very. That, there's the Heisenberg, you know, idea uh, in, in in poetry. Uh, absolutely. Um, um, the other thing that he's probably doing, if we're going to look at it in this way that we usually look at poems to read them closely in this way, is there's a redefinition not just in this poem, um, maybe less so here, but in others of what's beautiful, is that he actually, I mean, one of the things an artist does is alert us to new things that are beautiful. And um, Adam, I don't know if you can dr drag up the slide of uh, Between Walls, the poem Between Walls, um, in which he just looks at the pieces of a broken green bottle behind a hospital in the cinders. And clearly, like the, the wheelbarrow, which is a very humble object, and it's, uh, it's one of the early, it's a primitive machine, um, is uh, poets or, or artists are, are looking for what it is that's beautiful, and their own sense of it is what makes that poet's vision or that artist's vision um, endure, interesting to other people, or we feel like something is new here, not just in the form of it, but also in the... In, in the definition of what it is that's uh, that's beautiful. Well, there's a difference. Between walls, yeah, we'll look at the other one in a minute. Between walls, the back wings of the hospital where nothing will grow lie cinders in which shine the broken pieces of a green bottle. And it, it has some of the same thing that Jerry's pointing out about, uh, first of all, you can see formally it's the same, uh, form, participates in the same formal idea, but also it's a sentence it's kind of strange to say it's not a sentence that you would actually say, even though the words are ordinary, the diction, syntax, et cetera, is uh, very ordinary. It still sounds odd. And there's this moment of apprehension of something that is conventionally ugly. I mean, broken bottle in the back of the hospital. Right? Cinders. The cinders. There's nothing really pretty here, but he clearly has framed it as something to pay attention to. If we miss this kind of thing, we're missing something beautiful and important about life. That's the, sort of the implication. So much depends. So much, yeah. see, so much depends, and here's, here's a, a, another view of that. But even here, if you look at the verbs, it's not just, like it's shine the broken pieces of a, of a green bottle. It, it's shine, that's something beautiful. Glazed, glazed. I go to glaze, mm -hmm. will grow. Uh, and where nothing will grow lie cinders, not our cinders. Like there's this sense always of choosing something that that has been placed there and and enhanced by the words, so that you really are looking at a picture, some kind of picture that he has in his mind. Well, it's, yeah, it's it's the, it's the formal construction. I was I wanted I was thinking back again about about the the question of the imagination and. Um, you know, I highlighted, but we, I, I moved away from it. Maybe we'll go back. The, um, the, uh, well, let's see if we can get Williams. He said, it's, you know, Williams says, it is, it is the imagination on which reality rides. 
It is the imagination. It is a cleavage through everything by a force that does not exist in the mass and therefore can never be discovered by its anatomization. So, and, and this language, it occurred to me really just recently that it was coming directly out of Coleridge. And so I, I copied a page from Coleridge's Biographia Literaria where he talks about the imagination. And, and, and here you can see, he says, the imagination then I consider either as primary or secondary. The primary imagination I hold to be the living power and prime agent of all human perception. And I, and I often talk about this with my students, and it takes us sometimes 45 minutes to go through. So I'll, I'll say simply that what, what Coleridge is after here is, is the idea that the imagination is what creates the world, and it is connected to this idea of an, a prime agent, of a kind of godlike power. And it's the secondary imagination, which is what the artists use. And he says the... the um, uh, differing in degree in the mode of its operation, it dissolves, diffuses, dissipates in order to recreate, or where this process is rendered impossible, yet still at all events it struggles to idealize and to unify. And I think that's what you were talking about with Between the Walls, that it's, it's somehow taken something that is there and, and recreated it, re, reframed it anyway, um, uh, for our vision. So this is, this is the... This is, I mean, this is almost, it's romantic in its uh, origins, and yet, and yet no modernist in its approach. And, I mean, so how do you take his, Jerry, his, his idea of the imagination? Not, not Gorgeous, but Williams. What I think is interesting, I, I was thinking of, as you were speaking of Marianne Moore's poem, mm. in which she quotes, an imaginary garden with real toads in it. Yeah. And I think that this is almost the opposite. This is, this is the real garden with yes, imaginary right. toads oh, in it. This is what, this is what <laughs> Coleridge, cool reversal, yeah. Yeah. What Coleridge is saying. The imagination isn't, yeah. it actually allows us to see things. You know, it's, it's like when my daughter looked, you know, first was looking up in the sky and, and saw a plane. She didn't know what it was. When it came into consciousness as a thing, that was the imagination which allowed her to see it. It wasn't a... It's true. So you have to, uh, the implication is that you, you have to imagine a thing possibly first in order to see its reality. He, 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 talks about, he does talk about this in Spring and All. Um, poetry the imagine, does not tamper with the world, mm. but moves it. It affirms reality most powerfully. Talking about poetry and the imagination. And therefore, since reality needs no personal support, but exists free from human action, as proven by science, in the indestructibility of matter and of force, it creates a new object, mm. a play, a dance, which is not a mirror up to nature. So I think that's a new idea about what art... Well, but when, Coleridge, but when Coleridge says it dissolves in order to recreate, I think You're it's saying a that similar that's thing. Yeah, similar. I think it's a similar thing, and he's trying, but he's trying to grapple with it in this, in this new age, in this yeah. new context. And uh, uh, Williams famously said... Uh, uh, a poem is not made of thoughts, beautiful thoughts. It's made of words. And in another place, he said, it's a machine of words. So there's, I mean, his emphasis on the thing is made, a made thing, um, as a, an artist and as a poet. That's and this might be beyond what our, our scope here, but it, it, this, I, I read this as pushing towards language poetry, a, a radical poetry that focuses on the words as words. I mean, I have, I have an example here, which maybe I can find, of, of a sort of almost sculptural use. Um, yeah, here it is, Susan Howes, um, and she's playing on Thoreau, and, <laughs> and this is moving towards the, the words no longer, where, where meaning is no longer the issue. It is, in, it's, and I, but I would say this is even romantic. I mean, words were a spontaneous overflow of emotion, or you know, feeling recollected, emotion recollected, and tranquility. This is, this leaves you with a feeling more than it does a. Well, the way, but that's because it looks more like a visual work of art, right? That was it's more, uh, it's a collage, it's a cut yeah, up, right? It, and 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 it's a cut up, and because it's a cut up, and then here's some of Williams's fragmented, uh, in in this imagist period, we haven't talked about imagism, but right. in that that period where he's he's uh, writing these kind of smaller and sometimes fragmented uh, images. Um, that cutting up, though, is cutting up romanticism. And, William, and Williams is yeah, yeah. working against his own romantic tendencies. A number of formalist poets and other poets at the time identified him very much. Ebor Winters wrote a piece 
critiquing him very, very harshly, calling him like foolish, mm. senti- a sentimentalist. Yeah. Uh, while Stevens says he's he's a sentimental, yeah. he's a sentimental writer. Um, so the part of him that is a cut up guy is working against that. He kind of recognizes right. that, and he's setting himself free from Keats. And he's he's very he's very aware yeah. of Keats. His early poems, his very early poems, are just uh, romantic imitations, really. Well, this is this is what they say of Eliot. The sentimental Eliot was, you know, through pounds cut ups removed, and we were left with the modern. With the moderness. Um, so yeah, I see it, but I, I, but I don't see this one. This is more like the Dadaist, uh, Tristan Zara. You you had Kurt Schwitters up there before. Where what they're trying to do is uh, they they their spoken idea is anti art. Like we're going to take a piece of art or a text from Thoreau. Yeah. Right. Uh, from Thoreau. That's cool. Right. And then we're going to literally hack it. Mm. But I think I'm going to go back to the meaning and meaningfulness yes, yes. that you said mm-hmm. before when you, when you made your introduction. So much depends upon as, whoever is reading that is going to bring meaning to that. Once you actually see the red wheelbarrow and glazed with rainwater beside the white chickens, if you see that, then it's going to mean something to you. And, and whatever that is, he's begun the poem, we're finishing it. So I'm not seeing this as, as words abstracted from meaning. Instead, I'm seeing it as words as an entry to meaning. Mm. as something that, that you, you bring something to that so much depends. But words used, in, in my view, is words used more like paint strokes or brush strokes are used. Uh, if you put a locust tree in flower now for a second, <laughs> words used as paint strokes as much as, not, not maybe not more than, but like 50-50, um, as as much as they are used in the kind of newspaper meaning of the words, the dictionary meaning, just as with Keats or Shakespeare or Coleridge, they're using, <laughs> yeah, they're using it musically. In other words, it's it's uh, the thing that makes a poem is not like here's an urn. It really makes me think of old things and of truth and beauty. No, it's it's fifty percent music. He his music is such a distinct music. Uh, there are two versions of this poem: the locust tree and flower. On the right, here's one you can't even read. It has no syntax. It has no grammar uh, in the second version where he really reduces it. So it's more of a collage. And, uh, yeah. Stroke, stroke, stroke. Right. One word lines, stroke, stroke, stroke. Uh, and yet, like all of this stuff, very rigidly organized. Three, 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 one, which repeats even the feeling yes, of, right. the, of the... Of the uh, it's, funny. it's funny. Students often, when I start with the red wheelbarrow, say... Well, each each line looks like a wheelbarrow. Do you know this is the this is the <laughs> ultimate imagist <laughs> argument? It's it's very I don't know where it comes from. No, year after year, I hear this. It's like an urban myth. It's an urban myth. It really is. I have to say, I don't see a wheelbarrow. Yeah, I, don't. <laughs> no, but, but the I fact see it in my head. The fact that people do is, has been yes. a persuasive myth that follows that poem around. But this right. actually is, is is saying something quite different about image, word, language. Among of green, stiff, old, bright, broken branch, come white, sweet May again. Is that a is that an imperative verb, come, there, or is it re- relating to the uh, introductory uh, 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 prepositional phrase? Among all this stuff, come white, sweet May comes again, but it's not come, so it doesn't agree. I mean, um, but that's true. Yeah. The, the wheelbarrow so is an intensifier, so much to do. Yes. Mm-hmm. But it can also be, in colloquial speech, it can be, so we went to the store. So, mm. so, so much depends on <laughs> I mean, it can be a conclusion. It can be a concluding it, word there. To me, it has the opening of pride and prejudice to it. You know, it's this universal, so much depends. You know, every every... What, how, how does it truth go? Truth universally acknowledged. Yeah, the truth <laughs> universally acknowledged. So, I, so no one knows what so much depends. Right. right. <laughs> but the but but I want to get back to this question of meaning. So I don't. I, I feel like it resists. Jerry, how are you thinking about it? I see the wheelbarrow. I see right, the chickens. Yes, yes. I know I'm supposed to look at them because he's shown them to me. Yep. And there's a reason for that. So why am I looking at this? And, and to me, so much of life depends upon noticing, on noticing beauty, and on noticing so beauty where you don't normally see beauty. Back to breaking down the barriers. 
Yeah, exactly. I'm looking at another one of, of his poems where he, he keeps saying, I see. It's from also from Spring and All, mm. number nine, mm. um, actually number 11. And he says several times, I saw an elderly man who smiled and looked away. Uh, later on, he says, um, um, I saw a girl with one leg over the rail of the balcony. Mm -hmm. He keeps telling you visual details, and he keeps telling you that he saw them. So that, to me, is a pair to this poem. You're supposed to be looking. You're supposed to be paying attention. And that's what everything depends on. Attention must be paid. Attention must be paid. <laughs> <laughs> so Some death that, of a salesman. That, that act of paying attention. And, but also, and also the now. Yeah. The... The, that 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 moment of experience in the present, and yet, well, and yet recollected. This is this is fine. No, no, no. He just back to the tranquility. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I mean, obviously, the composition of the poem yeah. must be that Wordsworth would come right in and say, like, well, he had to. He, he wasn't actually in the moment transmitting. Dancing with the daffodil. No, he was not. He's dancing was. with the chicken. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we need, we do, we we do need to ask, uh, because w whether the poem is a poem, is a poem, and because there are, there are readers, and we we, we teach them every year. We teach them every year. <laughs> How is this a poem? What is what what makes it a poem? Uh, I don't get it. Even after even after dis class discussion, everybody kind of really does good work uh, thinking about what what is this thing, and a lot of ideas come up. It's still if it doesn't speak. To you, if you don't, after reading it and then reading it again, I, I make students memorize it actually, in honor of you know uh, the graduate of the school, etc. But also in honor of the poem itself. Before we even talk about it, we we'll memorize so that they have it in you know try to get at it some different way. But even so, people just um, I think a lot of people and poets themselves. We were talking about Dana Joyer recently. And poets themselves who don't see what the big deal is about this poem. I think when you get to the question of what makes something a poem right. or not, like even prose poems, when students are looking at prose poems, that, that becomes a question, why is this poetic or not? That's, that goes to 29,000 definitions of poetry. For me, it's a poem because it's reaching with words beyond words. It's a poem because we're looking at the world in a different way through a different lens. That's nice. I mean, reaching with words beyond words. I mean, that's really, and and I think that's the hard thing for people who don't have a lot of experience with poetry who might be encountering a poem like this, to understand like, well, wait, it's in words. I know what those words I mean. Know it's, yeah, it's, they're so plain and easy. No difficulty, except this kind of uh, per, uh, puzzling. So much depends. Or English teachers create difficulty where none exists. <laughs> one of our special. This is one of, the, yeah. one of our special. We're all really good at doing that. <laughs> But he helps it. He does it really. He does it really nicely because now it gives us that so much depends to chew on. Um, and I, and to follow up on what Jerry's saying, my, my my take on what a what a poem is is asking of a reader is actually not reading, but experiencing it in these ways. That's why we're talking about it. I think visually, the space of it, the rigid organization of it. Three words, one word. Three words, one word. Three words, one word. The stanzas. Um, that art object made, like looking at a piece of abstract art, like looking at a Franz Klein or a Pollock or art from the or Cubist painting. I'm going to show you another uh, the, example of, uh, of image and word together, very different. But this is also about the experience because, I mean, the you know readers know who, who are familiar with this with this uh, with this image that the poem and the image are, are don't go together. We have this sort of we, you know, in this version, a kind of uh, glassy-eyed tiger bear that looks, More looks like a, a panther, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, hardly, hardly terrifying. Um, and and really, this is uh, so. The, so without the image, the poem doesn't make sense. You might think it really is about a terrifying tiger. Um, yeah, it's, it's this question of of the experience. I mean, I feel like I mean, this brings me back to my own my hobby horse, which is the chickens. And the chickens are the the <laughs> chickens are the don't mess with the chickens. Are, <laughs> the, the, the chickens are the are the spectacle. It, that is the that is the the in the moment su surprise or, or experience. That is the now, and then it it's uh, it hits you 
Um, I don't know what else. They have to no, that's right. That sense of surprise. I mean, I think that's what lineation in a poem does. Why are poems? This is a piece of prose. We were saying, difficult as it is, why are poems written in these lines? Well, many reasons to create surprise. Do any of us have a full definition of poetry? I, I mean, I. Well, poets have had their go. Condensation, crystallization. I mean, there are lots of oh, thousands, thousands, thousands of yeah. right. Yeah. I mean, I often go to the dictionary to you know to sit on the table and ask students to to read it, and it is the flattest. The most unhelpful. I mean, this is just to say, poems. It's just, it's just to say. To say you know, <laughs> I have eaten the from the icebox, which you were probably saving for you know, and and, uh, and now I and now I see that we've we've come to our our 45 minute mark. Maybe maybe last thoughts, or or should we should we just jump into some questions? Um, we can jump into some questions, and then if you have last thoughts, we'll do that. Just about. Oh, You're hearing the voice of Greg Zaroski, who is helped uh, us organize and create this great event. We owe him a, a debt of thanks. But so, Greg, do you have a question oh, we, there? We or? have a couple of questions here. Love to, and, love to. And I want, would love to encourage uh, all the other listeners to type in some questions or comments. We'd like to hear from more of you. All right, my understanding is there's a, there's a little chat I'm looking at box. Here. And you, so anything yeah. you type will automatically appear on our screen. So, um, well, Here's a question. Uh, which, which teachers present, which of you three, actually Teach William Carlos Williams in your in your class or classes. Absolutely. I do. All of us. All of us. Every year, you know, in in, in many different ways and permutations and um, Harry. Every I mean, student I've ever taught has memorized the Red Wheel <laughs> and that's a lot of students. I try uh, in my classes also to include other hard man poets. Um, Anthony Hecht. People. Anthony Hecht visited very many times uh, um, and. It's just wonderful doing his poetry. So um, uh, Nicholas Christopher, August Kleinzoller, people that have written wonderful poems and, and were our graduates, uh, I, I like to include them. The uh, um, and the students respond to his work. I mean, there are there are certain poets I find Keats, for instance, um, Eliot, uh, Williams. There's a there's a, there's a they're not just teachable. There's something about the works themselves which, which still are, are alive for these readers. I'm, I've just put up the, and I found recently, uh, William Carlos Williams' transcript. I'm hoping it's clear enough for you at home to, to, uh, to see just what a lousy student he was here at Horace Mann, although someone pointed out to me that, that these were probably good to, you know, middling to good grades but in those days. The days before grade inflation. Uh, gentlemen, see, this gentlemen like see. Quite a lot. Um, but no, yeah, no. William Carlos Williams is, is is alive and well. Not not and not just at Horace Mann. I mean, that's, I think uh, his reputation is growing. I mean, one I think uh, one thing that's happening is that uh, modernism, the modernist poets, uh, Pound, Eliot, uh, Stevens, uh, uh, Williams, Frost, even really to some extent, the reputations are shifting, and that Williams has come on strong, partially because a whole new generation of poets. Um, has taken him up, kind of as a post New York uh, school poet, uh, Kenneth Koch, uh, yeah, I, Harris. I mean, uh, Frank O'Hara. Those guys helped m um, bring him forward and and and, and really uh, increase his reputation. And I'm showing a slide from Gertrude Stein, Sacred Emily, and, and and the language poets have gone back to to her as the modernist touchstone. But I think I think Williams and and Stein are uh, right two American that. voices. Really, and the juxt I mean, I just showed this one because it occurred to me that the juxtapositions, night, town, night, town, a glass, color, mahogany, I mean, she's also working with this play of brush strokes or... See, I see the similarity with uh, Langston Hughes. Mm. I'd like to do William Carlos Williams poems with, in conjunction with some, a study of Langston Hughes because uh, at first glance they're very simple and, and the, the vocabulary is easy and you're just looking at a few things, but then as you look at it, you realize a lot more is happening. So I, I think they both have that capacity to use simplicity to get to complexity. And I, I, I use E. Cummings um, yeah. in the same yeah. way, yeah. and I use a poem like this, which is absolutely unreadable. Uh, there, there, well, there are many ways to read it out loud, but it's not really a readable poem. It's absolutely a visual poem. He's really a, a, a an ancestor of the language poets. Um, so w Williams, in conjunction with Cummings, Cummings being a typographical experimenter, um, and Williams is Williams is uh, uh, 
discovery in the American idiom specifically of a way to make poems that are beautiful both in their image that's unlikely many times, the cod head on the beach, etc., or and out of that American um, diction to find poetry in that American language. That's, yeah. a, that's a thing that begins like in the mid-19th century in some ways, Huck Finn for me and Twain. And he's really the, the uh, Eliot's not, Eliot's mm-hmm. not really doing that. Pound's not really doing it. They're looking to the Europeans. They, they're, they have a European return address. Williams is very homegrown. Mm-hmm. Adam, if you get out of the uh, full screen, um, if they may help some viewers find the, the uh, question, the button for asking questions. Uh, yes. Do you want to read another question? I do. I have another question while Adam's doing that. Uh, what do we know about Williams' um, Horace Mann years and his experience? Just a little bit something about him. We may know very little. I don't know. He failed math. <laughs> <laughs> but his teacher told him that he would he understood the basic concepts and so that he, he would receive a passing grade. And I tell the story to my students and they, they are appalled when they think that there was a doctor running around who couldn't do math. Um, but apparently it was very difficult for him. Um, and he was, uh, he spoke very highly of the school. He wrote about it in his autobiography and commented on the school a number of times as giving him a first-rate education. He also talked a lot about the commute from New Jersey. He was coming from Rutherford, and he had to uh, com- he had to first take a boat across the river and then get on the very newly constructed subway to get up to Columbia. 120th Street. Um, and so it took him each day total commute was several hours, it was two and a half hours. Or something. I had it at some point. He, you know, he's in in two. He has written two little bits about his experiences here at Horace Mann, and and focused on the teaching of writing and uh, and the right his his writing of poetry while here. Um, right, he, I don't have that in front of me, but no, it's in the autobiography. He he just dis, he discovered uh, so this was a poem, um, and he found uh, and there were and there were more of them, and I think it was. I think it was Keats, actually. Well, this is this is what they're talking about: breaking breaking away from his attempts to emulate or to be the next Keats. Yeah, this is, but spring and all is, is is part of that. Um, here's a here's another question: um, Has Williams, in his writings or later in his life, did he ever comment on or or talk about the poem, his own? Interpretation, or his, uh, his, or his experience in writing it. He he said that of the poems in Spring and All, this is the only one that he remembered writing. Uh, he spoke about the writing of it, sitting at the sick bed of a dying girl, and he also moved it around. They in in Spring and All, the poems were numbered in general. They were numbered with Roman numerals consecutively, although the prose parts of the Spring and All were just numbered at random and, and, and not consecutively. Uh, and he moved it around a little bit. Uh, but this was his favorite one and the only one he recalled writing. We have a recording of him reading it, actually. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure I'm able to. Are you going to play it? Um, maybe, maybe we'll get to that. That would, be, that would be a good way to, uh, to finish up. We have a time for another question or two. If anybody wants to type in uh, let us, and let us see your thoughts. Uh, and then we will see if we can play the recording of him reading his own his own poem. Of course, later in his life, what's interesting too is that um, can you can you email that to Vicky? Some of the poems that we're looking at are those short, very American Zen-like uh, imagist uh, poems. Later in his life, he 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 used the collage technique that he was developing in Spring and All, for example, a mix of prose and poetry, um, to write a, a an epic about New Jersey, um, a set in New Jersey anyway, uh, that is also uses that, that collage. I mean, there are laundry lists in it, there are poems, there are fragments of conversation, all put next to each other, just juxtaposed. Um, and the poem, it's very great, and it's a, it requires a little bit of study. It's called Patterson. Um, and uh, it's it really it modeled in many ways on a, on a conventional epic. I mean, there's the body of water, there's uh, the Passaic River, and uh, uh, 
uh, that's a very rewarding uh, read as well. So I have this. I'm going to play it from my computer and hope that the sound comes through. Let's see if we. Uh, the red wheelbarrow. So much depends upon the red wheelbarrow. Glazed with rainwater the size of white chicken. Well, that's a, that's a beautiful way to, to conclude the, this session. And I want to thank all three of you for the time you spent uh, preparing this and also for uh, helping us reach out to alumni uh, beyond, beyond the campus of the school. And uh, this has been an exciting and uh, really fascinating virtual classroom here today. Yes, thank, thanks everyone for, for joining us. It's, um, uh, this is what we do all day, every day anyway, so it's, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be able to, to share it with some of you who, uh, former students and, um, and parents of students here. The, um, I, can, I, I just uh, want to end by saying that the um, one, that you should come back and, and see Horace Mann, and two, that the, the, the classrooms uh, here in the English department are so lively, are so um, vibrant and exciting. That it's um, that I'm I'm struck here at the end of the year with the halls quiet and the students now studying for exams. Just how much I'm going to I'm going to miss it, um, and just how much I want to come back to. Uh, I'm looking forward to coming back to the Red Wheelbarrow next year um, with with my colleagues. So thank you, Harry and Jerry. This is this has been terrific. Greg, thank you, and we have Vishnu here who's who's made sure that technically everything works. And uh, a big thank to Vic thanks to Victoria at uh, WebEx for, for helping us produce this. Now, Victoria, do you have anything to say before we sign off? Well, thank you all for, uh, for doing this today. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending today's Horace Mann School webcast. Have a wonderful day. You may now disconnect your lines.